says here on the cover, the summer of 1976, and way back then, several of us in this room were at San Francisco State. And I, you know, I don't know how it came about, but someone said, let's do a poetry magazine. <laughs> and we won't sell it, and we'll make lots of money. Wait a minute. <laughs> So this is actually this is the first issue, and, and it was a process of a lot of conversations, a lot of conversations, and then more, even more conversations. And we're going to read from this beautiful piece in the order of that we're in. Now, who was the first one? Uh, Martin. Martin. So Martin Joseph wasn't one of the editorial staff, but he's famed as being a known to both Peter and I. We didn't know that he, we, we knew he, and never mind, we didn't know that we both knew him until we both found out that we knew each other. So he's going to kick it off, and then we'll find out who's, who's the second one? Uh, I believe I am. Okay, and then it's Mark, and then me. No, then then me, then, then Mark. Mark. Okay. All right. I mean, you know. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Give him a round of applause because he's trying to find his bone in there. We might have to uh, adjust the mic. It's only about 10 days. I, I didn't remember that I had this one in first tone. <laughs> um, but yes, as Dan, as Dan said, uh, we we both of these guys knew me, but they didn't know that, that um, there was a connection. Okay, so this one is called Summer Night at Tortilla Flat. I should mention that in January of 1974, I moved into uh, a flat in 809 Castro Street, and uh, below me in 807A was one Peter Martai, and above me in 807 was one Paul Martai. So I was uh, part of a Martai sandwich. I was the Martin in Martin. the Martai sandwich. <laughs> so, uh, and we had roommates that included uh, David Leidig and Alan Acacia, who was the guy that you heard me read the feature about uh, in November and who passed away in December. It's called Summer Night at Tortilla Flat. These days are restless. <coughs> The summer is almost gone, and in the night, three spirits meet at the kitchen table. One is hungry. He reads reality sandwiches and yearns for a woman who will not see him unless she can have him. The second will watch no television when there is the sound of pacing next door. His thoughts of other places dissolve temporarily into a neck massage. The third has slept before and would keep the sweeter parts of an old relationship that has fallen like a ripe plum. Now he writes, and later he will stroll in the garden. These days are restless. Old cocoons tremble in a light breeze. The smell of gardenias and roses spills out over vegetables and mixes with the moonlight. <laughs> So next up is Peter, right? Peter, are you doing the next one? Okay. Our feature tonight is Peter Martin. Bring me back to this guy. All right. I, I should mention, and uh, Pamela Duvall. Yeah. Uh, and Karen Wigner. Yes. Is that her name? Yeah. yeah. Our co-editors. Co-editors, but we haven't been able to get in touch with them. We don't know where they are. Go figure. Who wouldn't want to be here? <laughs> so, uh, Martin alluded to Alan Acacia, and this poem is called To Be a Poet is Not Enough for Alan Acacia. And there's a quote. There's no tyrant like one's own mind. And that's Louis Ferdinand Céline. <laughs> As long as there is sleep, there is no madness. Regular pots of healthy soup, even a little loneliness stew, gives strength. Robot waiters and fry cooks love the world. They revel in it. A jogger sweating over hills, boys in trees. It's not enough to say acacias are blooming early this mild year. Saffron blossoms out of place. Winter sun warming remains winter sun. Brown East Bay hills are dark against the blue sky. 
It is not just nature to confuse the seasons. It is not enough to cry that I have no love in this empty January. Poets, go fishing. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. So this goes way back. I was on a bus, and um, the scene is from the bus, Muni bus. In the AM Sun of the Fillmore bus, this man, a study of fine lines, rough creases, rustling hands in his twisted bag of pecans, offers some as his talk wanders to the housewife whose robe is too small and smudged. Her feet bulge over her blue house slippers. Because their eyes met, he offers his food for consideration. A listener, she knows enough to say, no, I'm on a special diet. With a smile, he returns to the pecans at the very bottom of the small bag. There. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Give Mark a round of applause as he comes up. Yeah. 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 Woo. Woo. Thank you, thank you. It's very strange to see this literally. I haven't looked at this for what, how long is it? 40 something. 40 something years. So I looked at it and went, whoa. <laughs> anyway, here it is. <clears throat> and mom have not forgotten your hair image in the bath, frightened of my eyes, overaged schoolgirl, the final vibration of drink not yet there in New York, boys dropping pants in closets showed penis buds. Once the postman came to Joey's while we did it. Got so mad, told you I'd pull my own hair, red scalp, self angry. You said, go on. I raged, unable to skin myself or you, hating you, I guess, though sad to know it. Yeah. 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 